Let's open our Bible to Leviticus chapter 11. We finished up chapter 10 last week, and I thought I'd get much more done, but found out that it was just um, too much for me uh, coming back and trying to knock it out. And there were some great nuggets, some great nuggets in chapter 10. And I think one of the great nuggets for me in chapter 10 was at the very end, you remember the story where Aaron, his two sons, were uh, killed before God. God was the one who actually killed them because they had sinned before God. They had offered a fire, a strange fire, before the Lord, and God told them not to do it. And we also believe the boys were drunk in their priestly office. And uh, afterwards, in chapter 16, it says that do not drink wine and do not drink strong drink. And when you come before me, don't come anytime you want. There's a certain day, a day of atonement. And so the boys violated everything. So when Aaron saw his sons killed, it was God that said to Aaron, do not weep or do not cry. Do not even go to the funeral. In other words, if you do any of those, you're going to say that I was wrong. I'm right. You're wrong. Your kids were out of control. You didn't deal with it. So at the very end, it goes on, and Moses steps in, begins to raise up Aaron's two other sons, and getting everything back together. Um, it was interesting that one of the other boys made a mistake. He offered the wrong sacrifice. And I'm telling you, Moses went ballistic. And when finally Moses calmed down enough to come and talk to, you know, um, Aaron, and all I can think about is sometimes in ministry or sometimes in job, you just can't take no more mistakes. And finally, <laughs> it was like Aaron said, you know, Moses, this has been a bad day. Uh, you know, I, I lost my two boys. Um, I, I, things aren't going right. The two new ones are not doing a good job. And it says that when, Aaron, when Moses heard this, he was content. And it was like the greatest verse, I think, in the Bible at that moment for me. It's like, you just got to chill out. You're getting the most out of the people you can. They're going to have to grow a little bit more, but when they do, they're going to expect more. So Aaron basically just in humility, and it was Moses looking for the attitude. Well, the attitude was very, very godly. It was just Aaron was absolutely broken. And so Moses said, you know, I can deal with that. I can live with that. That's enough for today. And I think it's great when you come to say, okay, I've pushed the kids as far as I can. Let's back off. It's just enough. We, we made some distance today. Let's back off. Let's don't drive it home to break them. Let's bend them, not break them. So that's not even the Bible study, but I got blessed. So anyway, I like that one verse. You know, they did the best they could. <laughs> Shall we turn to Leviticus chapter 11 tonight, 11 and 12? Fun stuff. Uh, what do you mean? Well, what you can and cannot eat. Well, how's that going to be exciting? Well, it'll be exciting. I guarantee it. So if it's a lo you know, locust, man, I tell you what, you can barbecue that puppy, put some butter on it and honey and eat it. No problem. If it crawls, you can't have it. So, well, why? I'll tell you tonight. So here in chapter 11, we're going to take a look at clean and unclean. And so I want to take a look at the area of holiness. I want to deal with an area that I believe oftentimes we don't deal much with. Calvary chapels don't deal with it, and we probably need to deal with it much more. To be holy before God. Why would I ever want to be holy before God? Why would I want to alter my behavior to be holy unto the Lord? Well, first of all, because it's what God desires. He said, go out into all the world and, and preach the gospel. Well, people are not going to live or listen to you if you're not living what you really preach. And so we see here, there's only one verse that talks about the cleansing or sanctification or holiness by the Lord, and it's found in John 17, verse 17. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Underline that in your minds, in your heart, in your Bible. Sanctify them through thy truth. So here is one verse in the New Testament that takes the word holy and translates it into sanctification. So sanctification and holiness go together. So the word holy or can be translated to be holy or holiness. It can be translated to be sanctified or sanctification. And it's used 841 times. The root word has to do with set apart, 
for God and set apart from sin. So when I really take a look at what it means to be holy, it's a lot more than just being pure. It's about my life being dedicated to God, my life being consecrated to God, giving God the very thing that He desires. And it means to be set apart, and it means to be set apart for something. So God took me out of sin, but He has to bring me into Christ. And this is a major problem in our life. We have come out of the world, but we haven't come into Christ. And we've come out of the tomb, but we're not resurrected. So we're almost there. Well, he brought you out of the world that he might bring you in to Jesus Christ. So if I just stop at the cross, then my sins are forgiven. But that's not what he desires. He wants you to go through the cross, through the tomb, and out the back end, risen in power and anointing. You are baptized. Now you are risen with him in the newness of life. So it's that regeneration that God begins to work in and through your life where people oftentimes they get saved and they're content well I know I'm saved I know I'm going to heaven my life doesn't have a lot of witness to it but you know I know I'm saved well that's great but I think there's something much more I think there's a happier way to live your life you say well Steve holiness and sanctification is not the way to live it is because the greatest damage done is our guilt to our own personal conscience. We live very weird things. We have one life and another life. And when you have two lives going on, you're going to live contrary to your own convictions. And you're going to have a tough, tough time. And so in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45, this is what the Lord says. He says, I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourself. Now, underline that you sanctify yourself. You set yourself apart. You put that time and set it apart. Now, I will give you the spirit of sanctification, and I will help you. And one last thing, the word justification is the word that means just as if I've never done it. When you get saved, you're justified. But then there's the work of sanctification, and I believe that work goes on for your whole life. Be ye being filled with the Spirit of God. You're being sanctified every day. As you're in God's Word, He's going to cleanse you. As you're listening to the Word of God being taught, He's going to fill you. As all of a sudden, these things are going to happen. As you're obedient to the voice of God, your life is going to be turned on to Jesus Christ. For I am the Lord your God, and ye shall therefore sanctify yourself, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourself with any manner of creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. So he's also going to be talking about food. Uh, you don't want to be eating caterpillars. Why? They have a lot of feet and a lot of germs. You want to eat something that jumps. Why? Because every three feet it hits the ground and gets germs, but it doesn't crawl for three feet on germs. And that's just very common. Thing. That's pretty simple. Well, I know. God's pretty simple. He also says there's three million people. Yep. And everyone's going to the bathroom in their own backyard. Well, if you had three people, that's one thing. Three million that's a lot of smell, and that's a lot of dysentery, and that's a lot of hygiene problems. So Moses said, when you have to relieve yourself, take your shovel and go outside the camp and dig a hole and cover it. <laughs> you know, well, why? You don't want to be stepping in it. Cover it. Get rid of it. Don't let the flies get to it because that's what's going to cause dysentery. So some of the stuff is very, very practical. In fact, some of the stuff we've gotten to the point of building outside the city, you know, these plants and so on. So there are certain great things we can learn. And then verse 45, I am the Lord that brings you out of the land of Egypt to, uh, to be your God. You, therefore, to be holy, for I am holy. Look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, he says, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7, Sanctify yourself, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 8, Ye shall keep my statues and do these things, I am the Lord which sanctifies you. So 
the work of the sanctification is by God. And verse 26, Ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have uh, severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. So there's a little bit more definition. I'm going to be cut off, and I'm going to be drawn in. I'm going to be holy. I'm going to be sanctified. And God is going to be the one who does it. In Leviticus chapter 21, verse 8, Thou shalt sanctify him, therefore, for he offereth uh, bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, the Lord, which sanctifies you, am holy. And then two more in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And this is the New Testament today. It says, Be ye not unequally yoked, therefore, with unbelievers. Now, that can be in business. You go in business with a non-believer. Well, you're going to have a tough time. You're going to violate God's Scripture. Well, why, Steve? Because their value is not your value. Your heart is not your, their heart. They don't want to give. You want to give. They don't want to pray. You know, they want to play. And so you have nothing in common to work with. And so when God says don't go in business with a non-believer, he meant what he said. Because oftentimes those break up in horrible messes. And then he also mentions don't do it when you're dating. In other words, if you're dating a non-believer, why are you doing that? Well, I can't find a Christian guy. Well, I agree with you there. They're tough to find. But I tell you what, the way you're doing it is absolutely in violation to God. Well, I'm going to win him to Jesus Christ. No, because you haven't even won the Word of God in your own heart. God said, don't do it. You're doing it. You think you're stronger than the Word of God, and you think that your spirit is stronger, and you can say no. This guy is going to absolutely deceive you because you're getting the very best right now. He'll talk the language, but the moment you get married, he'll go right back to being an atheist. You're, it's going to destroy your life. And so God is seeking to protect you. He's not trying to ruin you. It says here, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? You want to go to church? He doesn't. You want to read your Bible? He wants to watch cartoons. You know? You, you want to pray about a vision? He wants to hire an attorney. So, you know, it goes back and forth. Fellowship of righteous and un, un, unrighteous. For what communion has light with darkness? There's no, nothing there. What concord has Christ with Belial, which is the devil? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? What agreement, verse 16, has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. A God has said, I will dwell in them walk in them, I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. In verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So there it is. If I'm not doing this, I'm not going to be received. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. So we're out there doing this because we're looking to have a mom and dad we're kind of going from bed to bed trying to find that love. It's not going to be found. In other words, you're violating everything about you, and you can't do that. First Peter says in chapter 1, verse 15, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now that's interesting because that means manner of conversation is manner of your life. Your conversations, what you say, the jokes you tell, everything else. Beware. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So when I look at that, I begin to realize, okay, God, we have to really face this issue. I mean, we don't like talking about it. We don't like talking about consecration or dedication or commitment, but probably we really need to. And interesting that there are four guys in the Bible that really kind of speak about this. And all of them were very interesting each of them were drawn to God. Each of them hit the ground sucking du dust. I mean, they just were broken. And every one of them heard God's voice. So the first one I think of right off the bat is there was Job. You remember Job. And Job 42, verse 5. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. I've heard about you from the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes have seen you. Wherefore, I abhorred myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, I've heard about you, but now I see you. And when I have witnessed who you are, the greatness, how majestic you are, I now realize how wicked I am. You see, sometimes 
we think we're really, really together. Sometimes we're really, really wicked. And the reason why that wickedness comes out and we're kind of just, we're never going to get busted is because of the fact that we don't realize that we've never seen God. If I've seen God, I'm never going to go contrary to what God wants. And so he says, I have heard thee by the hearing of ear, but now my eyes have seen thee. Wherefore, I abhorred myself and repent in dust. The second one you remember so well is Isaiah. Great example. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with glory. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that crieth, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims over, having a coal of fire from the altar with tongs, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, this hast thou touched, and thy lips and iniquity I have taken away and purged you. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And guess what? I said, Here I am, I'll go. And he said, Go tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. So you remember the story of Isaiah. He's walking around. King Uzziah has been ruling for 51 years, and all of a sudden he's gone. He died. And now, what are they going to do? For 50-some, 52 years, I think, he reigned. And so they had great trust. But in the year that King Uzziah died, it says that I looked up and I saw that the Lord was high, lifted on high. In other words, he was able to see God. Isaiah as a young boy, understood that because of his death and because he had to look up, he saw that the heavens were filled with the glory of God. And there he begins to see God, and God now touches his lips and he's absolutely pure. And he falls to the ground and begins to worship, and here his life is completely changed. I have seen God with my eyes, and I hit the dust, and God's picked me up and touched my lips and sent me out. And that's what it means. The, the coal of the fire from the altar has now touched your heart, touched your lips, and now you've been sanctified. And so it's not something that's, oh, I don't want to really do this. It's, I really want to do this, God. It's like if you're going to teach the crucified life, you have to do it with joy in your heart. You have to let people do it and say, I want that crucified life because most people don't. I don't want to die to myself. Well, I do want to die to myself because when I die to myself, great things happen. When all of a sudden I see God, he touches my heart. Yes, it's painful, but look at the benefits of it. The world has given me nothing. And then the third was Daniel. And Daniel chapter 10, verse 8. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned into me into corruption, and I retained no strength. In other words, I was devastated. I was blown away. I saw what you were doing. I couldn't handle it. And all of a sudden, one came and picked me up and touched me. Five times, it says that they came and they picked him up or touched him or made him strong or made him to see or made him to hear. In other words, God is helping him. And then the last one is John. You remember in Revelation 1.17, when I saw him, I felt at his feet as dead. John is now saying, I saw the Lord. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys to the kingdom of hell. In other words, John is saying, Man, I thought that Satan was in charge. I realize today God is in charge. So four guys living their lives in four different types of history, but they all had one thing in common. They all were just normal guys that saw God, that hit the ground, and God touched them. So that's what it means to be holy. That's what it really means to be sanctified by the Spirit of God. And so for me, what does it mean to be sanctified? I think the Hebrew word for sanctified means has different many meanings. It means to be cut off, it means to be separated, or it means to be dedicated. So here's the best way to understand this. Steve, are you holy? Well, I am dedicated. I don't feel holy, but I'm dedicated, and I am consecrated, and I have given my life to God. Well, therefore, you're holy. Well, 
I don't feel holy all the time because I get angry or things happen in my life. But the great example here is that when I dedicate something to God, I can't get it back. I'm not going to read it to you. We don't have time. But in Leviticus in chapter 27, it says, when you dedicate a house or you go out and dedicate a field or you finally come to a point where you dedicate a possession, it says in verse 28, notwithstanding, no devote a thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he has, both man and beast, of the fields and his possessions shall it be sold for redeeming ever. It is a devoted thing. Let me bring it down. When I give it to God, it's to God forever. It cannot be redeemed through Jubilee. In other words, this is it. I'm serious. So when I gave my life to God, I dedicated my heart. Now, it's not always been that way. God has always dedicated his heart, but I've gone back and forth. Here, what he's saying is that I need to be sanctified. And what that means is that God is asking me on a daily basis to be the Lord of my life, to, for me to dedicate that which I hang on to, for me to trust and give God the very best of my life, not to be afraid of giving the things I'm holding on to. It's like when all of a sudden I figure this thing out, I go downstairs in my basement, I open up a file drawer, and there is my title deed to my house. I go back upstairs, and I hand Jesus the title deed of my house. I said, this is what you've been searching for all these years. And he says, yes, because he wants to come in and change things and move things around, and I don't like that. Now, if you want me, great, but don't leave my life alone. <laughs> if you want me, fine, but leave work and my vacations alone. I want to be like a heathen. No. If you're dedicated, committed to God, then that's what it's about. That's, a, that's why when you look at Islam, it's exploding. Why? Because they demand commitment and dedication with no strings attached. They know what they're getting into. We as Christians, because he died for us, now we are to live for him. It's hard. But when in Islam, you have to die to get to heaven. So you're going to be looking for opportunities to die so you can be martyred. It's just a whole different philosophy. He died for me but they had no one. So when I look at this, I realize they are committed. They're totally committed. They're taking our kids. They're taking schools. They're taking everything. What are we doing? Nothing. Nothing. Because it's like we don't understand this thing. Have you dedicated your life? Yes. Have you consecrated your life? Well, yes. Have you sacrificed your life for your family? Yes. Okay. Then that's what God wants and not for you to be upset about it. You are a chosen generation. In other words, you've been in an elect race. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, or a people for God's own possession separated, that ye should show forth, in other words, which you've never done before, the praises of him that has called you. In other words, the whole reason that's written is that you might do something you've never done before. You're going to start praising God for your dedicated life. But not only why do I have to do it, but why do I need to? Well, notice in John 17, verse 11, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep thou thy own name, those whom thou hast given me. In other words, God keep them. And that's what he says. Why? Because, number one, I understand what it means to be. I understand that God wants me to be dedicated. I do understand that. I do understand that God wants me to be consecrated, and God wants me not to whine and complain. But one thing I'm learning is why, and the reason is because I want to be kept. And I cannot be kept unless I'm dedicated. And that which I commit, he's able to keep until the day of Jesus Christ. And I'm fully persuaded that that which I've given to God, he's able to keep it. So I can try to keep it. It won't happen. I can try to bury the gold. It won't happen. I can try to... You know, what do you do? I mean, do you put, you buy gold? Do you buy, then do you put it in the bank and let them watch it? Or do you buy stocks with it? Or do you get it and bury it? <laughs> well, probably the safest get and bury it. But I don't know. If you talk a lot, that might be real dangerous. But because now, going back to the bank, you know, everyone's trusting everybody else. But the safest thing is trust God. And so here, 
the reason I want to do this is because God will keep me and God will protect me. It says God will guard me in John 17, verse 12. While I was with you in the world, I kept them by thy name, and thou gave me. I have kept, and none of them was lost. Not only did I keep them, Father, but I also guarded them. I, Peter caused me a lot of problems, but we, we did it. We watched out. So, okay, if I give God my life, if I dedicate my family, then God's going to do two things. He's going to keep me, and he's going to protect me. Well, I can't do that. And then lastly, where should I begin? Well, really, it says in John 17, verse 8, For I have given to them the word which thou gave me, and they have received them which have known me surely, that I came out from thee and have believed on thee. In other words, I sanctify them by thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I would not sin against thee. So here it is, very simply. When I, when I open my Bible up, when all of a sudden I open this book up and I say, I just want to read tonight. I just want to read. I'm sanctifying my life. It's like the best example I can give you is like this is like soap. And you're filthy. <laughs> you've just walked through the earth. That's all you've done. You haven't sinned. You've just walked through the filth. And you've got, you have, you've got this film over you. You know, you feel filthy. And so you hop in the shower and you take the Word of God and you suds up, you know, all over. And you just feel, oh, you feel so good alive in Jesus. Well, why? Because you've taken the Word and you've used the Word on your own heart. So whenever my heart comes in contact with the instrument that works with the Holy Spirit, then you win your life every single time. So thy Word did I find, and I did eat, and it was the joy and rejoice of my heart. Wherefore shall a young man go and cleanse his way by taking heed to thy word? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's a lamp unto my feet. Take this book out of my life. I wouldn't be here. I'd be back in some Harley Davidson with a gun and probably dead. Put this thing in my heart, I'll stand before the world and preach Jesus Christ. That's the power of the word of God. And so tonight, or today, is it such a bad thing to be holy? I think it's pretty cool. Is it such a bad thing to be dedicated to something that you believe in? Is it so bad that maybe your friends can't even make up their mind what you want to do, but you have made up your mind? You've committed your life to the love of God? Well, then expect great things from God. In other words, God wants you holy because he's holy. And down deep in your heart, if you could go to bed at night knowing that you've walked this day pleasing to God, it would be a great day in your life.